Hey, what's going on? It's Jason Lucchese with the No Flipping Excuses Show. I am so excited that you're here today. I've got an amazing guest, an amazing friend with me. But before I introduce him, I just want to say, if you are not a subscriber yet on our YouTube channel, make sure you click that red button below. We would love to have you as a subscriber to the channel. And as usual, at the end of our sessions, we will continue the conversation in the comments section below. Would love to hear from you. And if you're listening to this over on your favorite podcast recording, make sure you become a subscriber over there as well. But let's go ahead. Let's jump in to today's show. I've got my good friend Daniel Clayman from Rehab Valuator from Richmond, Virginia. I've known this guy for Man, Daniel, it's probably been since uh, 2011, 2012 that we uh, <laughs> that we first met on that on that night where I think we were getting clam chowder for the for the first time and getting to know each other. I, I mean, it might be even earlier, like 2009, 2010. It might be. It might be like uh, this was before your vegan days, then through your vegan days, and now past your vegan days. Thankfully. <laughs> Oh, you didn't oh, think man, we were those... going to talk about that on the podcast. No, we, you know, it's important. It is important. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, no, I, I remember, you know, we, we met, uh, I was in for a mastermind and it was it was yeah. pretty cool. I remember you were just getting Rehab Valuator going. And yeah, right. it was in Charlotte. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Charlotte or Charleston, one of those areas. Um and you were just getting rehab evaluator started. I remember you kept having to get in and out of the mastermind because that's when you were dealing with your contractors a lot on your rehab projects. And uh, I'm like, man, this guy is busy all the time. Uh, and I, we were able to have a good time. We went out to, to dinners right. and got to got to know each other a little bit more. And now, shoot, it's we're, we're friends and, and it's been and, 10, and 10 plus, plus years. Into it, man. I know time, time flies. That was, you know, that was that was the days of innocence, you know. When well, shoot, you you were living you were living in one of your units uh, for your for one of your buildings, and now you've got three children. You've been married now for a while, and I know you've got a, a nice little piece going in in Richmond, Virginia. There, man, you've you've grown up. I thought you know you you can't stay you can't be Peter Pan forever. I guess. <laughs> yeah, I. I took my sweet time, but yeah, now, now life is different. Three. It, yeah, kids, for sure. And kids, I, I can't live in one of my quads anymore in a, in a small apartment. Unfortunately, that was a great setup. That and was, I remember, I remember you like lived in that thing for a dream, while. Man. That was the house hacking dream. Like I got, I lived for free and I got paid to live there every month. They cash like a thousand dollar check for living there. Um, but it changes once you have kids. And if you're listening, you know exactly what I'm talking about because once you have kids, you have all this stuff. You need space for it, and then it costs money. And so the days of positive cash flow on your personal residence that that comes to an end very quickly. Now yeah, that's true. I remember you had, you had your oldest uh, daughter come out, and she she is a spitting image of both you and your wife, and she she has that little you know Daniil attitude going on she she's the boss she's oh, she the, she's a boss for sure she's, she's such yeah. a little cutie she's gonna you know my, my my middle kid is a boy and he's super chill and then our our third is also a little girl and i think she's gonna give everybody the run for the money like she's gonna run stuff <laughs> yeah she's she just turned 18 months but i mean you can't tell her anything like she she's probably gonna give everybody a run for their money Oh man! So, I don't know what it is about claiming women, but they're 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 all gonna be freaking firecrackers, man. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. That's awesome, and yeah, it's it's awesome what you got going on there in Richmond. I know M Mike and I came out a year ago. Yeah, no, end of July we came out. It was uh, nice and humid in in Richmond, and uh, you had you had a uh, was it a twenty four unit building? It was a new construction. 24 25 if you include the commercial spaces plus or minus yeah that's right and now dude it's it's been done it's it's amazing project you've you did the aerial drone views of it 
Dude, it's it's and then you took Mike and I around Richmond, which we're extremely thankful for. We've acquired some some land since we haven't done anything with it yet, but we we plan to here very, very soon. But for for folks that are, you know, listening to this, you know, I, I know you obviously you're doing tons of new construction, but for somebody just getting started, especially in today's economy, I just saw rates for 30 year fixed mortgages are at 7.5, 15 years, obviously a little bit less than that. But I know you brought this up in your group because I love seeing uh, you interact in your rehab evaluator group on Facebook talking about rates and stuff. And I agree with you. I don't think rates to a huge amount really play a factor as long as you're buying right and you're doing the right things to it. But for somebody just getting started here, they're looking to transition from, hey, I'm wholesaling some houses to, hey, I want to possibly get into rehabbing, uh, possibly get into maybe rehabbing and then keep it for myself. What's some things that you would recommend to people when they're they're first getting started above and beyond getting rehab evaluator? Because we're going to talk about that at the end here in a little bit. But what what's kind of like that first kind of step from transitioning from wholesaler to actually being an investor? So uh, first I would say that, no, I mean, rates absolutely matter, right? The point right. made in my Facebook group was that if you can find deals that work at today's rates, and these are solid long-term deals, you should absolutely do them instead of waiting for the market to turn, the rates to go down, right? Or wait for some sort of a housing recession that's not coming, not anytime soon. Right. So, you know, the, 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 the point I kind of made to our, to our tribe there was that there's no substitute when it comes to owning real estate for time. The longer you own it, the better it does for you generally, if you can ride out the cycle. So you shouldn't be scared by today's rates. If the numbers pencil out and the deal works today at these rates. Yeah. Right. Um, but there's no question that high rates are impacting, you know, how deals pencil out, uh, they're impacting our ability to underwrite new development deals. Uh, they're affecting our ability to refinance out of some some older debt. Like the, today's rates are making everything much, much harder. And so I would say that it becomes even more important to be really good at finding cheap opportunities and buying correctly. Right. You know, cheap money used to cheap money in market that went like this. Hold on, let's do this so it's correct on the screen, like this, right? Cheap money in market that went like this covered up a lot of mistakes. It covered up a lot of gaps in people's businesses, not buying correctly, not knowing how to really underwrite deals. We, we used to get away with a lot of stuff. We used to be able to to maybe overpay a little bit. Whether again, we're talking about land or if we're talking about, you know, buying flips or, or buying rentals and, and the market momentum, right? That kept going up, up, up. That covered up a lot of our mistakes too. Yeah. Not being able to estimate our construction costs properly, right? Um, having, you know, not having a contingency high enough in our renovation or construction budget. So we're in a different market now. Money is expensive, so your ability to go off market and find opportunities at really good prices is what's going to allow you to continue doing deals right now, right? There's no, there, in, in any deal, and again, we can talk in broad strokes about ground up development, flipping houses. If you're just buying rentals, it, there's purchase, there's what you put into it and there's financing a lot of stuff you can't control you can't control financing right now rates are what they are the property is going to require whatever work is going to require and you're going to have to pay what you have to pay for that work so you can't really control those things i mean yeah you can under rehab under renovate if you're doing a flip and then you're just doing a crappy product so right. the point of the making is you, you can only control one part of the equation right now and that's purchase right yeah. you're gonna you're gonna pay for money what you have to pay for the money and you're gonna have to pay for your construction and rehab costs what you have to pay for them what the market dictates but you can control what you pay and that's where you make you know it's like the age-old 
saying you make your money when you buy. It, it's even more prevalent right now. So if you're a wholesaler, going back to your initial question, yeah, you know, if you're a wholesaler, if you're somebody that's that's doing flips right now, you want to get into long-term asset ownership, get better at finding cheap off-market opportunities that are still out there, and 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 then work on your financing relationships. Local banks are still out there giving out money. Now that money is more expensive, some lenders have tightened on their loan to values, loan to costs, but money is still out there, right? Get really good at, at sourcing deals cost effectively. And then and the next thing you should be doing is you should be working on your on your banking relationships. If you're gonna do long-term buy and holds, you, you could do it with private money, but it's not really scalable, right? You're going to need banks and for smaller deals under probably 10 million dollars we primarily deal with local community banks and you should be going out there and meeting as many of your local bankers as possible and and, and building building relationships with them and, and starting to figure out you know who's lending more aggressively what are their terms what are the rates how do i stack up am i bankable what are the lenders going to need to see in order to give me money for a property that i want to hold right so so it those are the two starting blocks so daniel why don't we why don't we dive a little bit more into the to the banking side because i think that's a, a huge component and i think a lot of people might feel like oh well i don't know if, if i can do that i haven't i haven't done any deals yet so let's just say we've done some wholesale transactions at this point Maybe we've got a few rehabs under our belt, but we don't actually own anything ourselves. So what would be the best approach then? Because, and folks too, if you wanna find like local banks, a great site that we've used for years is bauerfinancial.com. Go there, find all of the local banks, it's free. And you could also find credit unions as well. Um, but getting back to the, the question here is, what would be like a good approach for somebody? I know in Rehab Valuator, you've got something where you could put together like a, a really great presentation uh, that you can take to banks. But yeah. above and beyond that, what kind of like, how would you approach it? Because obviously you did approach it. You're, you are where you are right now. And you obviously had to have that first conversation with not just one banker, but multiple bankers to, you know, figure out different types of terms and financing and all that type of stuff. So. How would that work then if like, you know, I'm, I'm going in to that route and I'm, I'm kind of like, I guess new, but I, I've done real estate deals from a wholesale standpoint, rehabbing standpoint. So first of all, if you already have some wholesaling, some rehabbing experience under your belt, it, it's an asset, right? You, you can showcase that you have a deep understanding of the local market, that you have experience going direct to seller to source deals, which is incredibly valuable, right? When when it comes to doing deals. If you've done rehabs in the past, you should be always taking before and after pictures. Mm. Okay. Put together put together a simple bio. I mean, when I was starting out, I, I don't really do it anymore, but when I was starting out, I went into Microsoft PowerPoint and I put together a simple bio. Daniel Clayman, this is this is, you know, I had a corporate job before I got into real estate. So you know, if you have a W-2 background with any level of relevant experience or accomplishments in your field, that should go in your bio, right? You know, Jason Lucchese was the top rodeo rider in Indiana for seven years counting. That's right. You know, Giddy up. Boo, boo, boo. Top of your profession. That's important, right? It, show, it shows that you're able to excel. You know, Jason Lucchese has for the last seven years wholesale 300 deals in the local Indiana market. Every deal was 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 found direct to seller via multiple marketing channels. Um, you know, Jason has deep understanding of of the following zip codes and exper in deep negotiation experience dealing with sellers. Now, will these bank will these bankers want to see those transactions though? Because one, one thing that I want to ask you is that question. And then number two, do you think it would be better for people that are listening to this to do an A to B BDC transaction versus 
uh, an assignment of contract deal. Do you, do you think the banks would care or, or I don't know? None of, none of them are going to go research the actual transactions. Either. Okay. Like you're no banker is going to, is going to take the time to, to go through and, and look that stuff up. Okay. If it's wholesale deals, you don't need to list specific transactions that you've done. What What's relevant is your experience going direct to seller, your experience negotiating, your understanding of local market and local dynamics. That's okay. what's important, right? So, I mean, it can be literally a paragraph on, on, on your bio. With, with rehabs, I would pick top three or four, the ones that have the most dramatic change. You know, I, I, I got into this business doing gut renovations. I didn't do cosmetic rehabs. All I did was I took 100 plus year old properties that were on the verge of falling down and we brought them back to life. And so I had very dramatic before and after pictures that that, that showcase the renovations that I've done. Take top three or four. Those I would list the addresses and put some pictures in. You know, but bankers are in the business of giving out money, but they're in the business of funding real estate for a reason because it's tangible. They can touch it. They can feel it. They it allows them to be a part of these deals. So the more, and the same goes for your private lenders, the more visual you can make the deals, whether it's the ones you've already done or the deals that you're looking to get funded, the, the more tangible you can make them, the, the more exciting it is, I think, for the other person that's getting ready to fund it. So like one of the things I still do, and we're se segueing just a little bit and I'll come back. Yeah. But one of the things that I regularly do still is I take my bankers and I bring them through our projects. Usually, Smart. usually when the project is about to be complete, mm. this actually reminds me I'm finishing eight units next week and I need to call my banker <laughs> and see if he wants to come out um, before we move tenants in. But I bring my bankers through regularly through our projects because, because I, I want them to feel a, to, to feel like they're a part of the change. Yeah. Right. We, we, we all love real estate because we get to renovate or build something from the ground up and, and, and improve the property, improve the block, improve how, how many people are going to live for the next 70, 80, 100 years. We'll see how long these things stand, hopefully for a long time. Right. Um, but it's real change. It's tangible. You can touch it. You can feel it. And, and, and bankers appreciate most, I think, the same thing that we do, which is you can, you can see it. You can walk through it. You can see more activity on the street. You can see, you can see the difference that we're making. So, uh, so going back to pictures, right? If you've done rehabs, put pictures in your in your bio, before and after. Um, you have a team. You're starting to work with the team. You've done rehabs. You already have some contractors. You have an architect that you've been working with. List your team, right? Your, your, your bio can be three, four pages, but it, it's just something that showcases to the bankers that you have, uh, you have some relevant experience and you, and, and you've, you've kind of, you've, you're approaching this like a business, right? The, the, the next question is you're going to sit down, you're going to go and you're going to sit down with, with a couple of these guys and, and you need to be asking a question directly. How are you going to underwrite deals that I bring you and but also how are you going to underwrite me as the borrower because they look at both the deal has to make sense and the deal has to pencil out but you as the borrower have to pencil out as a risk as well that means you know how many years of my tax returns are you going to look at what do you typically look for in the in tax returns are you looking at credit scores what do you see in terms of credit scores what kind of liquidity requirements do you have? Mm. You know, do, what do I need to be able to show you on my balance sheet, whether in cash or other liquid assets? Once you get clarity on those questions, you're going to know pretty quickly, like, yeah, even if I bring this guy a good deal, I may not on my own be able to be underwritten successfully by this lender, right? At that point, you're going to say, well, Okay, but I've got a good buddy of mine, Jason Lucchese. He's really rich. Maybe I want to. Maybe he'll partner up with me, right? Because he can complement the things that I bring to the table, which is experience and time and desire to do deals. But what I'm lacking is is a balance sheet that will make the 
the lender feels secure about giving me a chance. Jason, this giant bank account, you know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he, man. He can, he can compliment what I lack, right? And maybe you only need Jason for a year for, for a few deals until your balance sheet is strong enough now and the lender is comfortable enough with you to give you money, right? right? But all those things you, you, you find out by asking questions, by asking direct questions. How do... Mr. Banker, how do you underwrite deals? You know, uh, what kind of deals are you looking to lend on right now? Are you only lending on, you know, some some local banks will only lend on 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 buy and hold and and ground up construction that will be held on the on the balance sheet for a long time. They don't want to fund flips. We, you know, we typically, I have a spec home building part of my business. And, and usually it's a different bank that funds the spec homes that we sell. They want to be in the short term game. Mm. I have other bankers that don't want to touch that stuff because they're going to work really hard to underwrite a deal. And then that money gets repaid back to them in six months. And they've got to underwrite another deal to put that money back out on the street. Right. So, right. Mr. Banker, what kind of deals are you looking to fund? How do you underwrite those deals? How do you run, underwrite me as a borrower? And what can I bring to the table if it doesn't seem like I meet all of your requirements? What can I bring to the table that would that would make you or your credit committee feel more secure in lending to me? Start having those conversations. You'll 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 get a you'll get answers quickly. I like that because even if you don't have a, a ton of experience with it, you can still go out there, still have conversations with these people and still, you know, start building kind of those relationships in, in your local community. I think it's 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 valuable to at least start going out there and start having these conversations and putting together like a, you know, little bio sheet like you were just saying. I think in today's market, too, if you can list out like, hey, I've, I've got a reliable general contractor, you know, that here's my projects, because some people don't have that. Um, and if you're coming in and you've got all of that taken care of, it already, in my opinion, puts you in line above somebody else that doesn't have that. So I really like that that you shared that. And then you were talking about different bankers doing different types of transactions with Correct. some of your deals. I know you've talked about like once you're done in the new construction phase, you did you I, I can't remember. I know it was like a year ago. You do you refinance it out of the construction loan to more of a, a stable long term loan or how do you do that? Most of the deals I'm doing now, we we get mini perms. And what that is, is a, a, a bank. So refinancing out into permanent financing Got, um, yep, that's is, right. more, is more common with, with larger deals where you can, especially when you can refine to non-recourse financing. Non-recourse means you're you're just on the hook for the deal and not your personal assets. You don't have to put a personal guarantee in the loan. Mm -hmm. yeah, most of the deals I'm doing, they're, they're under, like, let's say, 10, 12 million dollars so far, right? I've, I had a 30 million dollar deal that we put on ice because because of the rate environment. Yeah. Most of the deals that I do, we get a loan from a local community bank that is interest only during construction. Mm -hmm. And then once the property is built and stabilized, which just means we put tenants into it, we have leases, that loan automatically rolls over to an amortizing loan, which is just like a refi, except for I won't have to do a refi. It's good. And and that and that makes life a lot easier because I I am going into construction already having a permanent loan in place. And, and the rate the rate's locked, right? Usually, usually I think as of last 6 to 9 months what you will find is a lot more banks are hesitant to lock in the perm rate because they're locking a perm rate 12, 18, 24 months out. Right. And given the interest rate volatility, you know, it's like this. They're, yeah. they're a lot more hesitant to do that. This is the first time in, in the history of me doing business that I've seen banks push back on locking firm rate at closing of the construction loan. We're still getting it done, but some lenders are refusing to. 
It kind of makes sense, right? You've got inflation. Inflation's also playing a factor, especially in new construction, because they might see new construction holding up uh, your your timeline for getting projects done. I know last time when we were there, you were waiting on some simple little things that yeah. normally you would have pretty quickly, but you were now waiting months. So I could kind of see them having that that hesitancy because of you know our market right now. We this is what inflation's at a 50, 60 year high. We haven't seen a lot of these things going on at the same time uh, ever. It, in, supposedly in, inflation inflation is lower now. Um, ironically, I, I read yesterday ninety percent of the current inflation value is is housing. Like mm. most most everything else has has been tampered down, but because of lack of supply, real estate continues to go up. Rents can, are continuing to go up. Yeah. So housing accounts for majority of inflation at this point, to my knowledge. But you know, most of the supply chain issues that we experienced um, are, I feel like for the most part are resolved. There's still some gear issues with electrical that, that we're experiencing, mm. but you know, it's really not, I think the banks are more concerned about interest rate volatility right now. And, and again, less so now than probably three, four months ago. I, I think we all have a better handle now on how many more fed hikes are coming. Right. I mean, there was a period when, the Fed was just getting started, but we knew they're going to hike like crazy. Yeah, and 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 that created a lot a lot of uncertainty in in the market. Uh, right. I, I I think in twenty twenty four our financing environment will be probably more predictable. I, I don't know. I I I am not in the business of predicting rates or where things are going. I just. My gut tells me things will stabilize. Yeah, be be more predictable. I agree. If that makes sense, I I, th I still think they they might go up, uh, maybe a little bit more. Um, maybe I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> oh, n n nobody does, and and that's why again, like, I think if you're just sitting on the sidelines and refusing to do deals because you think rates will be a lot lower next year, I think that's a mistake. Yeah. Um, that being said, like, I, and I've said this before, I firmly believe that at some point in the next 10 years, we're going to see much lower interest rates again. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I firmly believe it's it. like the, the Fed has only so many tools in their tool belt to stimulate the economy and, yeah. and to drive and to stimulate demand. So something will happen and they're going to slash rates again. So like, yeah. if you can load up on deals now that actually work with this cost of money, imagine where you'll be if you have an amazing refinance opportunity in three, four, five years. It'll be unbelievable. Yeah, the cash flow, the immediate cash flow that you'd have coming in off of it, going from a 7.5 to a 4.5 interest rate would be drastic. Phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. by that point, you've already amortized your note. So you can either pull some equity out or you can refinance at a lower rate and the lower principal balance. Mm -hmm. Cash flow goes up even more. I mean, there, you know, if the deal works in this environment, which is challenging, right. then you'll have plenty of upside if the rate environment gets better. Yeah, absolutely. And I know as we're transitioning uh, a little bit in the podcast, I know we have a few minutes left. I wanted to ask you, would you for folks right now i know it might just depend on where their mindset might be but you transitioned away from single family to more multi-family type stuff and even you know building you build some stuff from a single family standpoint but would you what would what would be your take on somebody that truly wants to have real estate investing you know start having them really earning a great income from a monthly standpoint, like a monthly income standpoint, it's where they're not relying on wholesale deals to get closed, but that monthly passive cash flow is, would you say residential is kind of the way to go or multifamily, even like multifamily, meaning like duplex, uh, yeah. you know, something two units or higher. What what would be your take on that for some people that are thinking, oh, maybe, maybe going to residential or maybe mobile home or maybe a multifamily? What, what's kind of your take on that? There, there's there's two it's a two-part answer sure 
one, you have to kind of go where the market allows you to go. So maybe in your market, there's an opportunity to, to buy some, some value add multifamily buildings or eight, 10, 20 units and reposition them and you can get great cash flow. Then maybe you're in the market where there's, there's some single family homes that you have an opportunity to buy cheap that, that would make great rentals. It, it, it depends, you know, uh, single family rentals are not scalable. That's why I moved away from them. Mm, it's not point. scalable from just a cash flow perspective and they're not scalable from a property management standpoint. You know, we have an in-house property management team. It's a lot easier for my for my people to manage a 20 or a 30 or a 40 unit apartment building than it is scattered single family homes. Sure. And also, you know, at some point I, I got to the point where, you know, I work really hard to, to add this single family home to my portfolio and I now add three, four hundred bucks in cash flow a month. And it's at some point it doesn't become meaningful. Like you're you're working really hard. You're not making a meaningful contribution to to your bottom line. Yeah, it makes right? sense. If you're, just, if you're just starting out, by all means, like get some single family home rentals under your belt. They they are easy to manage. It's just not easy to manage a hundred of them, but they're easy to manage. Learn property management, right? Build build a foundation. I still own most of my single family rentals. I just stopped buying more. Yeah, but but the second part to that question is that you know mobile home parks do i buy class c properties that offer great potential cash flow do i deal in class a product that's more expensive probably cash flows less it, it, you also need to ask yourself very clearly like what do you want your life to look like mm. what, what what kind of assets do you want to be in the business of managing i some people get into certain asset classes because they offer attractive returns whether real or on paper and they find themselves absolutely miserable on a regular basis you know you bought a portfolio of section 8 rentals in indianapolis that's a headache Cleveland, right because cash flow on paper was phenomenal and you're just going to be rich overnight and now you're just literally going to court every day having to evict people you're dealing with crazy maintenance issues swat team is raiding your home that happened to me <laughs> my first my first section eight house I, I had a SWAT raid oh there was a SWAT raid on my <laughs> so you know it, it happens right oh my um, gosh. there's no money in the and look and, and please like there's lots of section eight tenants that are wonderful people hardworking. right but there's a lot of section eight properties that are a problem and they're hard to manage and you couldn't pay me enough money to manage that asset class. No. Mobile home parks, I don't know anything about mobile home parks, right? But I see some people jumping into like assisted living facilities and they don't know the first thing about assisted living facilities. And yeah. ask yourself what you want your life to look like. Money is not everything, right? So I, I primarily deal with high-end rentals. It's also why we transitioned into ground-up construction because ground-up construction allows me to build a really great quality product it's built well it's energy efficient it's maintenance free it's high-end finishes we attract really great tenants that pay premium rents they stay in the property for a long time they pay their rent on the first of the month they respect the property we don't have crazy drama we don't have evictions um i'm right now in the middle of uh, evicting a tenant and it's the first eviction we've had to do in over 11 years wow that's and that's a crazy long run there man without any I know. without any I'm, eviction i'm kind of i'm kind of upset that our run is broken and we've you know and we've offered this person just you don't know us anything you can just leave and we've given them lots of opportunities to not be evicted and i'm not happy about having to be in that position and making somebody you know move out it's not, and I, and that's the thing like i don't want to be in the business of evicting people whether right. they deserve it or not right so i i asked myself from from very early on not just how much money do i want to cash flow every month or how much money do i want to have but what do i want my life to look like mm -hmm. what right. how many headaches do i want to have what kind of product do i want to bring into the world and i and i said early on that like i only want to bring the kind of properties into the market where i would live in myself 
And so like, I like new construction because I get to geek out on floor plans, design, finishes, and I get to bring like a really good quality product to the market that I'm proud. Yeah, and ha having gone through some of your, your properties, dude, they're, they're absolutely amazing. They're blown away. They've got nice everything in them. And the, the thing that, you know, Daniel was talking about a little bit ago is, you know, making a premium product for, you know, a premium tenant. And when, when Mike and I was, went through them, stackable duplex, and they're so spacious. I know that's one of your big things is making sure they're spacious. Uh, the, I know the ones that we went through, two bedroom, two bath, they, they were absolutely amazing. I could see why you would get a premium you know, rent for that from somebody that's not gonna come through and trash your property. They're just immaculate properties and they warrant somebody that's gonna come through and really care for them like they're their own. It's just, yeah. it goes I, I above and beyond. Like, I want people to be excited to, to come home to, yeah, to what, to what we offer them, you know? And, and, and so you, you need to have alignment between what you truly like want your life to look like and what you're actually doing. Right. You don't, don't just get into specific asset classes because they look good on paper because you're then the only way you're going to get the returns that you're seeing on paper or if you manage those asset class as well and if you just wake up every morning and you dread you know sure you can pass it off to some third party property management company but uh, most are not good there are some good ones out there um and they're gonna have a hard time managing a difficult asset just like you would right so 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 two answers right do what the market allows you you know for 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 me, I got kind of into duplexes early because uh, duplexes are still treated like single family homes for the terms for the purposes of appraisals, uh, building code, but they're more efficient than single family homes because I have two units under one roof. I get to amortize the cost of two apartments over single foundation, four walls, water water meter, et cetera, et cetera. They're more efficient as rental properties than single family. Yeah, but they're still you know, attainable, you can buy them, you can build them. Um, and you can build a very solid, but most people listening to this podcast, you know, type of duplexes that we build, you can get 15, 20 of those under your belt over time, whether you buy them or build them, you never have to work again. Yeah. I, I definitely feel like it's it's extremely attainable uh, for for people, uh, especially if you're doing wholesale. You know, put put some of those funds and allocate it away, and you know, uh, you could start putting that into some of these projects as well. But man, yeah. th I, there's so many different opportunities that people can do. I, I highly recommend if you're just getting started, get involved with wholesaling, start making some money, start learning the real estate uh, business that way, and then start working long term for your portfolio as well because they they both work hand in hand like i feel like it's important especially if you don't know anything about real estate come in learn how to do maybe a few wholesale transactions and then if you completely want to transition uh to you know building or buying single family properties or whatever you want to do it, it'll definitely help you because you'll understand title you'll understand real estate contracts conversations that you could be having with sellers and buyers. It really helps and, and goes a, a really long way. So Daniel, I really appreciate you being on today's show. I've got a couple questions for you. Um, I know you love reading books and I love always being able to see when you're, you're post some new stuff. I, I normally, I normally grab them. Um, I'm an audible guy. I know you like to sit down and read the physical copies, but what's like maybe a couple good books that you'd recommend to people that that are on here um that you would be willing to share i mean i got books scattered all over my office so um <laughs> well what what's what's maybe one or two that's caught your eye and this is, like, this, is a, this is on my floor right now that i'm in the middle of reading this is a really great parenting book love it i'm gather parent are you are you showing the kids how to do the ice bath yet <laughs> i actually have they've done it with me oh really yeah yeah they, they were troopers about it wow um, this is literally what's on my floor that i'm in the middle of reading now or i just read 
but I usually read books and I outline them before I put them. Like I outline them in Word. I go back through them a second time. So I, I oh. just finished reading this book about just time management and delegating and outsourcing. It's really good. Dan Martell, he's like a software guy. Yeah. Um, he built and sold software companies. Now he primarily coaches other uh, entrepreneurs and software founders. But um, a lot of really good tips in this book about how to batch your time, how to get more yeah. done, how to get rid of sort of low value tasks and properly outsource them to to other people, how to hire an executive assistant, that kind of stuff. So if you're an entrepreneur, some really good stuff there. That's and a, then, buy back and your then time. I'm finishing this book now, which is more of a philosophy book. It's got nothing to do with business, but yeah. uh, really, really interesting. The Denial of Death. Yeah, I'm going to have to look at that. I've re read, have you read uh, The Untethered Soul? No. That that's a good one too. You might want to look okay. into that. That's that's a I'm real tethered soul. Yeah, yeah. I, I I like reading kind of a wide wide range of of stuff. I'm I I don't do a lot of fiction, but um, beyond fiction, like I I read kind of a, a wide range of books. I don't just stick to real estate or entrepreneurship. There's a lot you can learn by just going outside of your industry occasionally. I know you love reading those romance novels, so. I do, yeah. I mean, ever since they started, uh, stopped putting Fabio on the covers, though, it hasn't been the same. That is true. I, I, I feel it's the OG thing. of shirtless horse pictures. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, so we've we've got something with, so Rehab Valuator, if people want to check it out, we've got uh, noflippingexcuses.com uh, forward slash R. V so and that stands for rehab evaluator, but Amazing. yeah, we'll have them uh, go check it out. I think you've got, it's a, it's a free trial to check out the, the light version of rehab evaluator, right? But the, the light version is free. You can use it forever, right? Light version lets you analyze deals, wholesale deals, fix and flips, burr, ground up construction, uh, all the way through multifamily analysis. Um, light version gives you, legit deep analysis on, on all of those exit strategies. Premium version has a lot more bells and whistles. It's got, you know, lender presentations, uh, just the lender presentations alone that you can spit out in a couple of minutes have secured our clients, you know, tens and tens of millions of dollars at this point. Um, huge credibility builder, but it's yeah. got built in cost and budget templates for every kind of project. It's got a full project management suite with scheduler, in-app accounting, uh, even lender draws. It's got uh, marketing for your wholesale deals that you can create very easily and syndicate them to social media. You can create web pages for your specific marketing deal, uh, wholesale deals you're looking to sell. Uh, it's got, it, it's, it's, it lets you do a lot. It's not a, um, oh, comparable sales uh, after repair value calculator, max offer calculator. It's got all of that stuff built in. So basically, Dang. We're not a lead gen software, but once you get a lead in, Rehabilitator can take over and do everything else. From Dude, research it's, to just, the property. it's remarkable where the software has come from yeah. your day to where it was on like, well, it was on like an Excel document. Oh yeah, it, it was, it was an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, but we're getting ready to roll out in a couple of months, rental comps to the software in addition to sales yeah. comps. Um, probably at skip tracing at some point in the next year. So we're, we're constantly updating it, constantly improving it and constantly undercharging for it because not good at business, I guess. It's, it's an amazing software. Go check out the light version. If you want to upgrade, you'll have an opportunity to do that. But right now we've secured uh, it at no flipping excuses.com forward slash R V for rehab valuator. But uh, Daniel, dude, it's been so much fun uh, having you on the show. Any parting words for our folks? No, no. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. You need to come back in town. Bring Mike. Come back soon. We'll we'll, we'll make another day out of it. It'll be fun. Absolutely. We'll, we'll go get some steak this time. No, no vegan tofu blocks. God, listen, <laughs> that was, that, eating with you was painful until you saw the light. 
I, yeah, I, I'm seeing it now and we'll, we'll uh, definitely have to come back. I appreciate you, my friend, for coming on here and sharing so much. Uh, for those of you that have watched this, make sure you give this video a thumbs up here over on YouTube. Drop a comment below what you liked so much about this show. Give me the at least one thing that you enjoyed most about today's show. If you're not a subscriber, make sure you click the red subscribe button below. We would love to have you as a subscriber. You'll get notified of brand new shows just like this each and every week. And if you're over listening to this on your favorite podcast player, make sure that you subscribe over there as well. But on that, thanks again, Mr. Daniel Clayman, for being on the show. Make sure you go visit noflippingexcuses.com forward slash RV. Thanks. See you later. Later. Hey, go grab a copy of our brand new book. We'd love to put this in your hands. The Art of Flipping Deals. You could go grab your copy today at theflippingbook.com. Make sure you head on over to theflippingbook.com. Com. We'd love to get this in your hands today and show you exactly how you could get free exclusive inbound leads in your business today. Make sure you head on over to theflippingbook.com. Take care. Bye.